Good evening, everybody. It's been an honor to be present among physicians to and their willingness to listen to a urologist. So, the topic I have been given and what I want to comment upon is like what is nephrolithiasis and how do we prevent or re uh, prevent the recurrence? Why do we need to prevent recurrence? That is the main issue. Why do we are wanting to prevent recurrence? The first point is most of the patient who undergo any sort of stone surgery is likely to have recurrent stone within a period of 10 years. So what are the factors that are determining the recurrence of the stone? When we know those factors, we can of course prevent them. So as we all know, almost 15% of all the patients who report in our OPD will have some stone disease or maybe related problems related to stone disease. And where the region we are living in is a part of a large stone belt extending from, you could say, Jammu Kashmir, Punjab, Rajasthan, Gujarat, this is all north and northwest of India is a stone belt. So, why do patient comes to me? Patient comes and tells me, okay, doctor, you have done the surgery for me, fine, you have done a good job, that's very nice, thank you so much. But the first concern of a Punjabi patient or any Indian patient would be, Aage kya karna hai, doctor? Isko rokna kaise dubara na ho? Aap kaise insure karte ho? Do you guarantee me? They can even use the word guarantee. So, anyway, I have to be prepared for that. And the similar thing will help you also dealing with your daily practice with stone patients who come with stone recurrence. So why do you want to have uh, why why do you want to prevent recurrence? Because we know that some sort of proper education by the patient taking care of his diet, his lifestyle, it may help in reduce their chances of forming stones. Although still the chances will never become zero. So diet modification is important and it has to be strict also. So, but, but before that, I would like just like to point out certain things which may come across to medical students and practicing physicians in their common OPD practice. The patient or your relatives, somebody may come with ultrasound, ki doctor meko opinion do, I have been detected with a 5 mm stone, 4 mm stone. Number one, I would like to clearly point out from a urologist's point of view, it is very, very, sometimes even 2 or 3 mm stone. It is very unusual and unlikely that a stone of 2 to 5 mm will cause any cause of pain until unless it ends up in the ureter. Kidney is a large area. Any stone which is 2 to 5 mm will not cause any sort of pain to the patient. You must look for other causes of the pain. Secondly, ultrasound is an ultra-sensitive device which can sometimes over-predict stones. I have many times seen the same stone which is visible on ultrasound is not present on CT scan. CT scan, plain KUB is the diagnostic investigation of choice in case you have any doubt about the existence of stone. So don't be pressurized to treat patient on curative treatment. Don't ask him, I will give you some medication, this stone will wash off. I have seen many or many or thousands of patients who have been given medication unnecessarily. Why I say so? Because they have been taking this medication just in hope the stone that is lying in the calcula, the stone that is lying in the kidney will wash off. Sometimes it is just Randall's plaque, sometimes it is just whitish area, sometimes it is medulla which is hyperechogenic on the ultrasound. So it is it has to be confirmed with a CT scan, but that is a costly investigation in our scenario. So let's stick to our basic instincts and our clinical acumen. Otherwise, you can give dietary advice that is of course can be given at any stage, even a patient with stone who has got his stone removed or who has a 4 to 5 mm stone. Besides that, some physicians, some practitioners may indulge in something called flush therapy. I want to stress it is obsolete now, nobody does this, it is to be condemned basically because in case even if the stone is lying in the ureter, you may end up putting more pressure on the opposite kidney which is the normal kidney and then helping the patient, you may end up damaging the patient. I have come across in my practice patients who had, you could say, ureterolymphatic leak, ureteric basic severe pain and infection because of the flush therapy. This is almost a weekly scenario for us. So what are the myths that we encounter in our daily practice? What are the facts from a urologist's point of view? The diet can help in curing a stone or even if patient has got a stone already in situ, the diet can remove it. No. There is no role in the cure of the diet. Hard water, toxa mere pin da pani bada hard hai. It can lead to increased stone formation. No. Can I drink our water? The answer is no. Stick to your normal water, whether it's a tube well water or a underground water or a pipe water, it will not harm you any further. 
and I will stop taking calcium because I have heard taking lot of milk, taking lot of paneer etc. will cause me stones. I will avoid taking calcium. But on the contrary, taking calcium is going to help the patient. This is again a myth. Can I take youngsters are and of probably the Punjabis are more happy to have beer and alcohol that may help them flush out the stones. But again, the answer is no. It's just a myth. Beer will can cause some diuresis which may help in having more urine but not in removing the stone. So, so again, as I told, the main stress on in our case in dietary advice should be on taking lot of vegetables, fresh fruits, also increase. So these are the things that can that can help the patient to have prevention of recurrence. So it is the fresh fruits and vegetables and a high fiber diet which is going to help the patient. To the coming to the basic etiology, why the stones form? The basic phenomena of forming the stone is hypercalciuria or some metabolic causes like hyperleukosuria and hyperoxaluria and cystinuria and in rare cases especially in pediatric patient renal tubular acidosis these are the causes which cause stone so whenever we talk about stone patient is insistent doctor manage karna ki main jaake udhi jaanch kara lena wo kis cheez ka bana hai main biochemical analysis kara lena hai then i will prevent that thing in the food and i will be relieved of the problem for the future the answer is strict no you will be surprised in my 15 years of practice as urologist, I have never, never ever ordered a biochemical, uh, biochemical analysis of the stone. Patient may have done it on his own, but not me. I have not prescribed it. I would rather go for it after removal of the stone, after patient has a normal lifestyle, I would rather go for a 24 hour urinary citrate, urine, uh, 24 hour urinary citrate, urine, uric acid, these investigations. Not a simple test like biochemical, which is not going to help the patient in future. So, Basic things that can help is that can cause stone are dehydrations, food rich in oxalate, animal protein, especially red protein, red animal protein, salt, don't increase the sodium intake, phosphates, obesity. These are the common things which can lead to recurrence of stone. So ask your patient to avoid these things. And the things which can help are water intake, calcium, take some calcium, low still take some magnesium, potassium citrate and high dietary fiber, especially insoluble fiber. Water is going to be the easiest and the most practical thing to do. Ensure the patient takes so much of water that he urinates around 2 liters of urine per day. I mean the frequency of taking water and interval of taking water is also important. It should not happen that the patient takes 1 liter of water in the morning and in the daytime he he dehydrates himself or he causes renal dehydration leading to most stone formation. It has to be intervaled. The intake of water has to be intervaled so that the, uh, the basic phenomena of stone formation of aggregation and precipitation doesn't happen in the tubules of the kidney. So what are the next thing that we are talking about is oxalate. Oxalate usually combines with calcium to form calcium oxalate. Calcium oxalate stones are the commonest among the kidney stones. So avoid oxalate. So what are the things that contain high oxalate? It is almonds, amaranth, palak, beets, cashew nuts, kaju, okra or bhindi, gooseberries and grapefruit. These are all things which have high oxalate content. They have to be avoided in their diet. Besides that, there are other products like peanuts, strawberries, tea, tea and wheat bran that can also have high oxalate content. And the other myth that is regarding dietary calcium. Calcium is believed to neutralize the absorption of calcium oxalate and lead, further leading to non-formation of stones. So have adequate calcium in diet. Calcium supplement because especially in postmenopausal female we have come across patients who have taken high supplemental calcium in form of tablet or everything. They can take them with meals so that they can reduce the absorption of calcium along with oxalate. But Alone taking calcium is not harmful. Supplemental calcium, supplemental calcium has to be taken along with the meals. Regarding proteins, avoid high protein diet. Why? When we studied, we know that if the, if the protein intake is reduced from around 90 grams to 50 grams, we can have a 50% reduction in stone formation. So most protein rich fruits, uh, things are usually, those are animal protein origin. These can further break down in the body to form purine, which can further lead to cystine stone formation or uric acid stone formation. So, risk of kidney for stone formation is greater with animal than rather than the vegetarian protein. 
so you have to avoid red protein, red meat, especially mutton, etc. You can have some small amount of. Uh, you can advise your patient to have small amount of chicken at least weekly once, or at the max weekly once. So besides that, animal protein also has a high sulfur content, which can lead to increase in sulfur containing amino acids and form the rare form of stones called cysteine stones. The most important advice that I give to my patients after they come in follow up for the stone surgery is low sodium. I have observed if you just reduce the sodium in the diet to less than 3 to 4 grams per day, it can lead to wonders for the patient because most of the diets which are patient, the youngsters are consuming these days have high sodium, high oxalate content. They go around, especially in Punjab, they go around to all the ladies and the uh, sellers who are selling on the, uh, uh, on the streets and they all have the sauces are high in oxalate, high in salt. Reduce the sodium intake less than 3, it is very rare that you will have recurrence of the stones. Aim for less than 3 grams per day. So enjoy your food without added sauce, no, no extra namak on the salad, no, you could say the no, no pickles, enjoy with vinegar etc. And check your food labels, if somebody's processed food is supposed to contain more of salt. The next thing that I want to point out is potassium. If you take adequate amount of potassium, it is going to help you and reduce the recurrence of stone in your patients by up to 50%. So use potassium in form of fruits and vegetables. What about the soft and carbonated drinks? They are supposed to contain high oxalate. Moreover, the uh, other carbonated drinks like caffeinated drinks, they are dehydrating. So every cup of caffeinated beverage that you drink, do drink another glass of filtered water with them. Sugary, or sugary drinks also lead to calcium and magnesium misabsorption and leading to once increased risk of stone formation. Your body must be able to buffer the acidity of salt drinks with calcium. So in further leading to hypercalciuria which is affecting the kidneys leading to more and more stone formation. Carbonated beverages consumption has been linked to diabetes also, hypertension which are indirect causes of stone formation and they are of course leading to chronic kidney disease also. The things that can prevent you is citrate. Citrate acts as inhibitor. Stone formation is not as simple as precipitation and aggregation. It is a mixture of two or three phenomena. Of course precipitation aggregation is the basic phenomena but over and above there are certain stone promoters and stone inhibitors. So citrate is found to be a good stone inhibitor. You have to take good amount of citrate. citrate. It may be in form of lemon juice concept let's drink more of khara as we say in common language so that we can have our stone out. But it is more towards prevention rather than towards cure of an already existing stone. Orange and carrot juices are high in citrates. They can be promoted. Fiber, the most important thing that I advise my patients is low salt and high fiber diet. Where does the fiber come from? From the whole grains. Whole grains usually have insoluble fiber. Insoluble fibers helps to reduce the calcium in the urine, prevent hypercalciuria. So it combines with the calcium in the intestine, binds it and the calcium is created with the feces instead through the kidneys. So the main purpose is to prevent hypercalciuria, intrarenal hypercalciuria. Sugar, as we discussed earlier, stones are associated with high levels of sugar intake, so eat less of sugar and there is also evidence that consuming sugar, if they reduce the sugar uh, intake by one third, the stone prevention is possible. Alcohol, this is a topic of interest to everybody here. So alcohol, you can have some amount of alcohol, not, not directly linked to the stone formation, but of course alcohol drinking alone over long sessions can lead to intrarenal rehydration because people take it over long periods without accompanying liquids and water etc. So this leads to internal rehydration and hypercalciuria indirectly and further leading to stone formation. So cases of men who are, who are regularly drinking alcohol beverages like beer, they have upped their risk of suffering from gout. That is another factor leading to stone formation. And so prevention of uh, excessive intake of alcohol is essential. Vitamin B6 is a very important drug in prevention of stones. I always promote my patients to have enough B6. So anybody, everybody, every patient asks me, Dr. Sir, is there any stone that you have to do? So thiazides can help. In my usual prescription after a stone surgery, around after one month of a stone surgery, is, it does include hydrochlorothiazide, which comes by the name of 
aquasite 12.5 mg twice daily. In addition, nowadays we have found that certain probiotics, especially oxalobacter, if present in adequate quantity in the intestine, can lead to less absorption of oxalate. So, the tablet by the name of oxalobacter uh, perfusions can be used on daily basis for next three to four three to four months after stone surgery. Besides that, of course, as I told you, high fiber diet is going to be the main thing that is going to help along with low sodium intake. But of course, physician can consider use of supplemental potassium, potassium citrate, potassium magnesium. These all come in syrup forms uh, to our uh, this thing. But as I told you, my usual advice to a patient who's already undergone stone surgery is number one, nobody guarantees a recurrence of stone not happening. Number second, you have the, you are the one who is responsible for preventing your stone. Don't blame it on the endoscopic surgery. Don't blame it on the open surgery. It is just related to what you take, where you live, how is your lifestyle. Take low salt diet, low animal protein. Do not go for junk foods. Take physical exercise. Make essential yoga helps a lot. Take frequent liquids. Interval them. Take alkalizers initially for three to four months at least. And also you can advise them oxalobacter formigens for other other probiotics for a period of four to five months and it has to be a personalized diet for the patient i always ask patient aapka lifestyle kya hai aap kya kaam karte ho aap kahan rehte ho what is the food habits how many meals do you take in a day this all can help you give a personal instead of giving them a printed chart which is always uh, ready to serve with us through companies so provide them a personal diet chart it takes five to seven minutes but slowly and slowly you will have issue so only thing my advice to my physician friends here, very few of them are present at the moment, is don't advise patients with small insignificant stones, don't give them unnecessary treatment. Always try to advise the patient that these small stones are not expected to cause any pain. You must look for other causes and besides that, if you find come across any bigger stones, of course your urologist friend is just a street away. Thank you so much.